Okay, so um, my name is Olivier, and my presentation today is on decentralized mixers in Bitcoin, and specifically, how do you dispense with the trusted third party? So um, before I start, just uh, a bit about myself. I'm a master's student at University of Montreal under the supervision of Alain Tapp, and when I started my master's, I was interested in um, privacy in the digital world in general. I didn't know about Bitcoin, and uh, some way through my master's, I, I read about Bitcoin first, and I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is really interesting. But what really caught my attention and, and my curiosity was just how anonymous is Bitcoin? And it turns out really that Bitcoin is not anonymous. I'm not going to go into detail as to why this is the case because that was quite well um, explained by the ZeroCoin presentation uh, this morning. Um, but I mean, there's a, few, uh, there's a few papers that really do point towards the idea that for uh, most users, the vanilla Bitcoin um, protocol is not anonymous at all. There's just so many ways that personal identification, identification can leak um, whenever you're entering or exiting the Bitcoin network. Say you buy your first coins, assuming you didn't mine them. So you buy your first coins, you go to your exchange, and now your exchange knows the correspondence between the address you have and, and uh, something about you, uh, so, uh, some information about you the same way when you're exiting the network. Also, if you put up an address on your web page or your blog or, or just on the forums uh, for donations, well then that persona is associated with your address. So it's easy to have your first address or addresses um, identified like that, de-anonymized. But now you might think, okay, so say we have user Alice here that has address A1 that is associated with her and she does not want that to be the case. So she'll, um, just think, all right, well, uh, I'll empty my entire address A1 and send it to A2, and then nobody will be able to find me. But of course, that's not true, because, well, people will just know that, okay, the entire address was emptied, A2 probably still belongs to Alice. So really, in this case, no anonymity is gained. Now, um, you might think, this is way too simple. Let's do something more complicated. Let's split the input in half. Um, and then send half to one side, half to the other, split them again, rejoin them. Now. It does happen that with network analysis, it's actually pretty easy to find those, uh, those cases and to retrace, um, well, actually know that all these addresses actually belong to the same person. Now, um, I find this problematic for many reasons that were well, mostly explained in the zero talk coin, uh, in, the, in the zero coin talk. Um, and uh, so, so I won't go too much into it, but I, I just, Personally, I find it quite uh, scary that my credit card is able to guess what my next purchase will be. So I really think that's something that we do not want, but I'm not the first person to be interested in there and, and doing that. And there have appeared over the years um, decentralized, uh, centralized, pardon me, mixers uh, that are also called laundry services. And these mixers work in the following way. First of all, they receive public input and private output addresses. So on the left, we have the public input addresses of Alice, Bob, and Charlie, that those addresses are considered contaminated and not anonymous. And um, these parties are going to give the mixer new addresses on the right that are not publicly associated with them at this point. And so the mixer is going to receive the coins from the public input addresses going to mix the coins and send the mixed coins back to the output addresses. Um, so one example he could do here is um, send, the mixer could send Alice's coins to Charlie, Bob's coins to Alice, and Charlie's coins to Bob. And so the idea here is that if you're looking at the blockchain, uh, you only see that the address A1 sent to an address on the, on the right, but of course the C2 handle is unknown. So um, the uh, so it would be hard to guess really to whom the addresses on the right belong. Of course, three addresses like that is very uh, insufficient. We would expect uh, well, dozens or even hundreds of people to participate in such a mixing transaction. Now, you have to realize here that the mixer did create this permutation, this mix, and thus knows the correspondence between the addresses of, of each of the parties. So it would be able to de-anonymize every party there. Now, the model we're looking at here is a restricted model of the mixer, and uh, it works on the idea that, uh, on the assumptions that the number of input and output addresses must be the same here, which is not always the case in real mixers, and also that the number of bitcoins mixed must be the same. Now, imagine this were not the case, it would be really easy. Say Alice is the only one here that has, say, seven bitcoins that goes as an input. Of course, she's going to want to receive seven 
bitcoins as an output. So anybody that's looking at the blockchain can just see, all right, seven outputs on uh, seven inputs on the left, seven bitcoins as an input on the left, seven bitcoins as an output on the right. This is definitely the same person. So that really defeats the point. We don't want that to happen. So standardized um, sizes that we'd be looking at here. Now, I find it quite ironic that the Bitcoin network is really built on the idea that you do not need to trust anyone. You don't need to trust your bank. You don't need to trust the Fed. You don't need to you know, trust an escrow. And, and so you can really do everything there on your own, except if you want to be anonymous. And if you want to be anonymous, you have to trust the mixer. Uh, and I think this situation is problematic um, for, for two main reasons. The first of all is the mixer can just leave with your coins because if you give your coins, I mean, do a transaction from Alice to the mixer, well, um, then the, the, the mixer can just uh, disappear. And of course, if, uh, if you don't know who, uh, who the, the, this mixer is and you can't go knock on their door, you've lost your coins. Now, I'm not aware of this happening before um, on, for, for mixers, but it has happened for, for a lot of um, of exchanges uh, and other Bitcoin centralized services. And the second downside we have here is that the mixer does know the correspondence between the addresses. So you gain no anonymity with respect to the mixer or with respect to anyone that is colluding with the mixer. So say the mixer's okay, he's a good guy, and, but then um, either a criminal group or the FBI or whatever comes knocking at the mixer's door and says, uh, do we want to know the correspondence of Alice's address? Well, then the mixer might be, uh, might be forced to cooperate. And with those problems in mind, we can wonder, can things be done differently? And it appears that they can. So the idea here is we want to take out the centralized mixer and that trusted third party, and we want to replace it using multi-party computation. Now, in the general case, what multi-party computation does is it removes the need of a trusted third party from any protocol. So, so it, it's a bit, it, it really looks like magic. Now the downside is it tends to be quite expensive in terms of uh, computing power and number of exchanges that the people need to do. So we'll be looking at that, how, how we can use this. And we want to use it to uh, get users to work together to mix some coins without the centralized entity. And of course we want to keep the property that the output addresses are unlinked to the input addresses. So just to compare, if, if we look at the centralized mixer or the decentralized mixer, well, of course, users are going to get together. In the centralized case, they have to physically do it, well, not physically, but do a transaction from their own account to the mixers, whereas in the decentralized case, there's no such thing. They always keep control over their coins. Um, in the centralized case, the mixer will choose a permutation, whereas this permutation is chosen by the users in some secure fashion in the decentralized case. And of course, um, well, if the mixer is honest, it'll give back the coins and it works on the, the other side too. But uh, the centralized case, in the centralized case, the users are not anonymous with respect to the mixer, whereas they're anonymous with respect to everyone, even the other users in the decentralized case. So how do we do this? Well, there's two approaches that, uh, that I've been working on. The first one um, is I call the transaction blueprint, and it works in the following way. So, so what we want is to find somehow, we want to find a way to, uh, for the users to choose a secure permutation. And once that, when we want to choose the permutation without the users knowing that the addresses on the right, who they correspond to. So they, of course the addresses are gonna be known because anyways it's gonna be known in the end transaction on the blockchain, but the correspondence between those addresses and the users on the left must stay unknown. Now uh, what the users are gonna do is choose this permutation somehow. Uh, one user proposes a transaction or it can be a, another party, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So it proposes, say, this permutation here. Um, and then if, Everybody, every party checks that the transaction is honest. That is, you want to make sure that you're not putting in coins and never receiving them at the end or having less coins or, and so on and so forth and so on. Um, and then if, if the transaction is good, is honest, the parties will sign the transaction and it's just sent off to the network as, as any transaction would be. So um, this is one approach. Now the hard part is how to build this, uh, this permutation in a secure manner. And there's two ways that have been proposed before. The first one was by um, Manny Rosenfeld, uh, who's here with us this weekend. And he called it, well, he used commutative encryption to do it. And what he does is encrypt 
each of the output addresses and send them to, to a user in such a way with, with, that when they're decrypted, it is impossible to know who that address came from. Now, the downside of this is that it doesn't scale very well. Uh, for three players, it's, it's actually quite, quite easy, but for n players, it, it only scales to, uh, well, it, it takes the, the square, uh, we need uh, n square uh, encryptions and decryptions where n is a number of users in there. So that's quite expensive and prohibitively so at this point. Now, there's a second approach that was proposed by Edward Z. Yang in 2012, and he uses secure multi-party sorting. Um, and in this case, it's a, it's a general multi-party protocol that takes all the addresses on the right here, and that takes them, takes them as, as private input, inputs and outputs the list of the sorted addresses in, in alphanumeric terms. Now, the fact that they're sorted is strictly useless, but what is interesting here is that it produces all the addresses without um, revealing who, who inputted what. And at this point, Alice can just send to the first one, Bob to the second one, and Charlie to the third. Again, we have uh, problems with the feasibility of this, uh, of this manner to, uh, we have problems with feasibility because um, it requires quite a certain number of comparisons and a certain number of rounds. And the, the big downside here is that comparing large strings, as Bitcoin addresses are, they're rather large strings for these, and it, it's hard and it's expensive. So um, really no implementation of this at, uh, at this point. Now, there is a second approach that uh, I'm, I'm pioneering here that uh, uses a circuit of very small and simple transaction. Now, this transaction was also inspired by Ronnie Rosenfeld, and um, a, I call it the two-party anonymization gate. The idea is the following. We have only two players here. We have Alice and Bob, and together they will uh, decide, all right, we're going to do some mixing. So they each produce uh, an input and an output address. Well, the input address they already had, but anyways. And so they produce output address, an output address, and they can actually share it with one another in this case. So this is uh, different from the previous case. Um, and they're just going to, once this is established, they just flip a coin. And that coin is going to decide, do I, do they send, does Alice send to Alice and Bob send to Bob? Or does Alice send to Bob and Bob send to Char uh, sorry, and Bob send to Alice? Now, of course, uh, Bob or Alice can't cheat in this because this is one like atomic transaction. So uh, Alice can't wait to, to have received her funds and not send the funds to Bob. That's not how it works. Now you're going to tell me, well, this is entirely useless because, of course, Alice knows what Bob's address output address is. It's just the one that isn't hers and, and vice versa. And you're right. But what's important here is that these players have gained a certain amount of anonymity with respect to others that are just walking, uh, watching the blockchain because, um, because they do not, these, these users do not know the results of the coin flip. They do not know if, uh, w which address on the right belongs to Alice and which address belongs to Bob. So this is the idea. You build um, circuits out of these very simple and not very anonymizing transactions to get a better result. And, and uh, what we want to have here is to maximize the resulting menentropy in you know, complicated terms, but the idea really is to minimize the probability that an adversary could be looking at these, uh, looking at these transactions, looking at the blockchain, and uh, guessing the correspondence between the addresses. Now, we have to be careful here because N is in all mixing protocols. The adversary can actually be part of the mixing protocol and uh, either be malicious or, or an active or just look at, uh, look at the results of, of, the, of the transactions. So really this min entropy here that we're trying to calculate depends on the number of adversaries, on the position of these adversaries uh, on, in the circuit and on the result of the coin flips. So there's three circuits that uh, I'm studying at the moment. The, most, the, the first one is really quite simple. There's and users that get together and they just say, all right, we're gonna wanna do some mixing together. So just every round, pick someone at random and do the two-party anonymization. So that's what the, the players do. And uh, after a certain number of rounds, they, we stop and say, okay, so how, what have we gained? Well, chances are you've ended up mixing with a few people. So somebody looking at the blockchain will, you know, have a, a little harder time finding out really who you are. But the downside with this approach is that you can be unlucky and, you know, just mix with a few people, always the same people, and uh, 
and then it's, it's really, you, you've barely gained anything. So to, to answer well, to this problem, um, I thought of using a butterfly network, which is a, a network that has the interesting property that um, at the end of the execution, Alice could be anywhere. So it's a, a, a log depth um, circuit, which is optimal for, for what we want here. And it has, that's it, the property that if, even, if an adversary isn't looking, Alice could be anywhere at the end of the protocol. Now the downside with this is that all permutation of inputs are not possible, which means that if an adversary is included in the protocol, that adversary might actually gain a lot of information on to, uh, as, to what, um, as to where Alice might be at the end. And so the final circuit I'm looking at right now is essentially two butterfly circuits uh, pasted together, and it's called the Venice network, and it has this interesting possibility uh, the interesting um, fact that it has, it can do all the possible permutations. So this is, I think, the most uh, complicated network we want to do because otherwise it's gonna, it's gonna become too expensive. So the depth here is two log yeah, n minus one. So a little more expensive than the butterfly network in this case. So if we look at the two approaches here, we have in the, uh, on the left the blueprint approach and on the right the circular transactions approach. The blueprint approach is hard to do. It, it, it requires a certain number of uh, CPU cycles just because doing multi-party calculus in the general case is quite expensive. And so it's computation, computationally hard. Um, also, it is quite prone to denial of service attacks. The idea is that when uh, a person that does not want it to work can go through the entire protocol and at the end, when it comes the time to sign here, they can just refuse to sign transaction isn't signed, it's not going nowhere, nobody will accept it, so the, the, uh, the entire protocol has to fail at this point. Of course, no money is lost, but it, 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 the service is denied. Whereas for the circuit of transaction, if there's just one person that's not doing transaction correctly, you kick them out of the network, and, uh, and that'll be it for, for, for now. Now, on the other side, um, the transaction blueprint only has one transaction, so it's quick confirm, it's easy on the network and the transaction cost is low, it's actually particularly low even compared to, uh, to, to standard centralized mixers. Whereas for the circuit of transactions, it's quite the opposite. The large numbers of transactions means that, um, that you're gonna have a, a higher cost, a uh, higher burden on the network and it takes quite a bit of time too before every transaction is confirmed. And with those two in mind, there is a third approach that I call the hybrid approach that's really a mix of this typical centralized mixer and um, the blueprint approach. And it works in the following way. You just imagine the centralized mixer we had at the beginning, but instead of giving your coins to the mixer, you just you ask the mixer to produce a secure permutation, as, as he actually did in any case. Um, and uh, and then, if, uh, and then propose the, the, the transaction blueprint. If the transaction blueprint is acceptable, everybody signs it and it's sent to the network. So the good side of this is that the trusted third party can't run with the money because to make sure it never actually owns the money. And this is quite easy to implement, I think, because uh, it really doesn't take all that much calculation to do it. Actually, not at all. And the downside, of course, is that no anonymity is gained with respect to that trusted third party. Now this could be mitigated by chaining together um, those types of transactions with different mixers that you would assume are not all colluding together. So the end result would, would be with a very high probability a gain of anonymity there. Uh, which brings us to the conclusion. So what's next really? Um, I'm still looking at new ways to create some blueprints. Uh, I'm really interested in having some feedback from the community there. Um, still working on the analysis of anonymizing circuits, which, um, which, which take us a certain amount of time to, to completely uh, understand how the circuits work and, and what's the result. And what I'd be really interested to see in the future would be a real world implementation, even if it's just the hybrid approach. So just as closing thoughts, I think that very strong anonymity is preferable to no anonymity at all. But I think we really have to have a discussion as a community about how we're going to deal with, uh, how we would deal with such a very strong amount of anonymity. Thank you. Any questions?
I'm not an expert in this sort of field, but I just had a really basic kind of dumb question, which is how is the output address sent to me as a user? Like, how do I know that this is my new address? Like, how does that get sent? Well, well you actually have to create it yourself. Well, in Bitcoin, creating a new address is just, you know, really easy. So, right. so you just create one, but now the hard part is getting, getting it on the right order diagram without Needing, uh, without the mixer or the other parties knowing that this address corresponds to you. Right. Of, of course, it's going to end up on the right side. It's going to end up on the blockchain anyways. But, mm -hmm. but hiding the correspondence between that address and your initial address is the hard part. I, yeah, I understand that that is the hard part. I just feel like in the sending of, like, I get my new address, you know, there's, there seems like a, a possible vulnerability there. Like, how, like, who, like, what do I use? Like, where would I find my new address? Like, you know, just like create it, okay. create it out of the loop. You know, is it like a wallet service or is it like? A no, no, it's really well. Of course, your new address would be in your wallet. Yeah. But from my understanding, wallets will just you know you got a button generate new address. Yeah. And and then that's it. You really don't care what that address is as long as it's new and never used before, or or actually it doesn't even have to be new. It just has to be not associated with you previously. Okay. Yeah, I, I get that. It's just, I don't know. This, I just wanted to ask the dumb question in the room. Thank you. So as uh, far as you're aware, there are no implementations of anything beyond you know, the current mixes. There's no Yang implementation that you know uh, of? No, I don't think it has been done. Okay. Uh, I did uh, ask him a few questions about his implementation, and he said, yeah, it would be kind of cool, but I think his main, the, 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 he seems to say that the main uh, problem right now is comparing the, uh, that comparing strings is very inefficient for long strings. Okay. So, uh, and, and any I, implementations of the, the Benes that you just talked about or any of your circuits? Have you put that in? No, not at all. all. It's just okay. uh, something that... You've got a paper though, right? Or I, guess I, we I, I actually haven't published yet, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get something. I don't know if it'll be published in a journal or end up in my memoir. Thanks for a great talk uh, from a fellow Thank Montrealer. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, were you on the Bitcoin Talk forums asking about examples of yeah. uh, mixers? <laughs> okay, I replied to you with the link to Tor Wallet. Yes, but uh, Tor Wallet is actually a wallet and not a mixer. It was both. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I tried to look it up and I, I couldn't find that yeah. it, it did some mixing service too. Yeah, it had a mixer and a wallet. And okay. And I just wanted to make that comment. And the, the other thing is you're looking at mixing where the number of inputs and outputs are the same. Yes. But I, I think the real use case you need to look at is more inputs than outputs. And the reason I say that is because we can do a pretty good job of uh, being anonymous because when we spend a transaction, we can be careful not to reuse input addresses. Our change addresses are always different. We don't reuse addresses. But the issue is at some point, you're going to want to spend something bigger than any uh, unspent outputs that you possess. So we need yeah, a secure way to combine basically small inputs into large ones. So the way I see it, you, you really need to talk about more inputs than outputs and a w secure way to do that. I understand and that's this. it's going to change the dynamic a little bit. But, um, yeah, okay. So, so what I was thinking is that you could actually combine all of those uh, small inputs into one input address that you would input here. But the downside of this is that by putting them together, you associate them and you say these were actually all the same per, per person. Now, after that, you, you can get anonymous again. So I don't think it's all that much of a problem, but maybe, yeah, I can see it as a past problem. So you have um, many addresses that did some spend transactions and that you don't want these transactions to be associated together, even if they're no longer associated with your future address. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I think that's a good consideration. Yeah, you could have, um, let's say you have 20 inputs and 15 outputs, and you wouldn't necessarily know the number of users. Um, I think that's what you kind of need to go for that you have a lot of inputs, you don't know how many individual people those inputs represent, and you don't know how many individual people are represented by the outputs. I, I understand your point, but the hard part here is that if you do that, well, of course, you're going to want to you want about the same balance minus transaction fees. You're going to want the same balance as you had as an input. And if you have different balances there, well, you're going to be able to associate the input and output addresses, which defeats the point of the entire mixer. Right. You, each user wouldn't necessarily take one output. They could take multiple ones. Okay. Well, then I, I guess it becomes uh, an example of a subset sub problem, which I believe is hard, but you need a certain amount of users to do that. You really need a higher amount of users than uh, 
I think, than, than most mixers handle at this point. Probably, yeah. That was my thought. Thanks. I'm curious what uh, you think about um, having uh, the users, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have their input addresses and then they generate an output address and then just sending their uh, input address and output address to a trusted third party and then the trusted third party combines multiple users input and output addresses, but doesn't sign the transactions, just returns the set to the users for them to sign themselves. That's it. That's exactly what I'm proposing with the uh, the hybrid approach. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, made, I'm not made it clear, but that's really what I think is the best way right now to proceed due to the fact that, well, at this point, the circuit of transaction approach is not well studied at all, uh -huh. and that the strictly multi-party transaction blueprint approach is inefficient. I think that's the best way to do it. Okay, so, so for the third party, they don't need a blueprint. They just need to combine all the addresses together and return them to the users. Yeah, I guess, I guess you can do that, but the, the blueprint okay. isn't really anything special. It's just the idea of you know, producing the permutation. And so it's, you could say it in natural language, this person sent to this, this person, this person, well, sorry, this address sends to this address, this address sends to this address. But I mean, I, I thought of doing it as a, as a transaction itself, you know, in the transaction language, but it can be done like, a, you can write it in any language you want, really, as long as the information is propagated. That's the important part. Cool, well, I think you have a very good idea. Thanks for coming and sharing today. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you for being here. <laughs>